Okay, all right. So I will recap a little bit more from the previous lecture. We started with feedback. Okay. So feedback and stability. So we talked about this um, last time. A S and beta feedback plus minus this is x of s and this is y of s okay and what is our uh, what is our open loop gain i just want to write these out what is called open loop gain a, a of s okay then some other term called loop gain hmm? we also call it t of j omega what is that ah, beta a s and then there is a closed loop gain. I think if you if you internalize three, these three terms, then you'll be all clear. You know, you'll not get, never get confused. And what is the closed loop gain? Y s divided by x of s is equal to a of s divided by one plus beta a of s. Everyone is clear about that, right? And then we talked about the Barkhausen criteria, where what was the Barkhausen criteria? Beta of a s hmm? mod of that equal to one, and then angle of a s beta is equal to minus one eighty degrees or one eighty degrees, whichever way. Okay, so basically the denominator becomes equal to zero as a result of which uh, the gain goes to infinity at that frequency, and we we want uh, this uh, beta times a of s to be minus one eighty degrees. Okay, and for a uh, for a amplifier, we don't want this to happen, but for an oscillator design, we want this to happen. We are specifically looking for beta a s equal to, uh, you know, minus one, okay? And then we talked about, uh, we started with a, with a frequency re response, hmm, which looks like this. Hmm, and uh, I introduced two terms for you. What were the two terms? This is, um, then phase is zero, minus 90 and minus 180 degrees. So this is one. So here we go like this, something like this. Okay, and what were the two terms we learned? Gx and Px. What is Gx? Uh, gain crossover. Gx is gain crossover where the gain becomes unity gain. So this is Gx. And then Px is when the phase is? minus 180 degrees. So let's say, um, of course, you may say that it's asymptotically going to minus 180 degrees, but there'll be some stuff um, out there at high frequency which will pull it down. Okay, so let's say here it happens at, um, this is our Px. And is this a good situation to be in? Okay, and what are we plotting on the y-axis? Is it open loop gain? Loop gain, remember, okay loop gain, which is beta A of S, 20 log beta A of S, and then what is the x-axis? Log of omega, okay, it's a logarithmic. Now this situation is bad, I started with a bad example, and what was the reason for this to be bad? When phase equal to minus 180 degrees, uh, there is some component at the output which is greater than one, unity gains, the gain is higher than one, and as a result of which what will happen? When the feedback reaches the microphone, it will amplify. Again, it reaches amplify. It will, it will keep doing that, okay? And then you will have an oscillation. We don't want that. That's the reason we don't, I mean, we don't like this. So what is the ideal situation? We want the uh, phase, phase crossover to happen later and gain crossover to happen earlier. And if you just take a design and open, this is what you'll end up with you know, as a first shot. So what you do, there are multiple things you can do. Uh, let's call these frequencies. Uh, this is omega P1 and omega P2, okay? All right. So one thing is you can, um, you can reduce your uh, beta, okay? So if you reduce your, this is a beta A S, so I can drop the beta, and the new thing is gonna look like this. Okay, something like this. And now what do we see? So uh, the, the, the new uh, gain crossover is, is, the phase crossover is not changing. Okay, because we have not, the pole locations are not moving, we are just changing the beta. Okay, so we are reducing the beta, so we are pulling down 
uh, loop gain is reducing. Huh? And then, so we are pulling down the entire gain transfer curve down. Okay. So now in this case, what we see is, let's say, something here. Okay. What is this term now? This is our new gain crossover. The phase crossover is still the same. Okay, because phase has already become 180 degrees. Everybody is with me on this? And this should be fairly stable, I would say, right? Because the, uh, the gain, even though the phase goes to 180 degrees, uh, the phase has, uh, sorry, even if the phase goes to 180 degrees, our, uh, our gain is already below, uh, below unity, okay? So then there is no question of amplifying it further. Everybody gets this, right? Because these are the fundamentals, all right. So this is what we want to end up in. Now, um, if you do this, um, I mean, this is one way to do it, okay, uh, that you can, uh, and then I introduce a couple of terms. Uh, one is called, um, at this point, is called phase margin. Mm -hmm. So phase margin is when the gain is equal to unity gain. When the gain becomes unity gain, how far away are you from the danger zone of phase equal to minus 180 degrees? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So in this case, this is, uh, you know, let's say here, at, at uh, look at the, the blue curve, okay? So the, at gain crossover point, when, um, when the gain is equal to unity gain, what is my phase at that point? First you look at it. So let's say at this point, the phase is, um, let's pick a number, minus 100 degrees. I'm just picking up a number. Because it's minus 90 already because of the first pole. And the second pole is approaching. So we are slowly going down, okay? So it's at minus 100 degrees, okay? And how far away are we from, from minus 180 degrees? How far away are we? 80 degrees, okay? So the phase margin in this case is equal to 80 degrees. Is that clear? Okay. And now the gain margin. So gain margin is exactly opposite. When the phase is 180 degrees, minus 180 degrees, what is my gain? Is it 0 dB or is it less than 0 dB? How far away am I from the 0 dB point? Okay, And that's the margin that I have in the system. Because we are working on margins here. You cannot get a perfect answer. We want margin good enough so that under all process temperature voltage condition, our system should be stable. We cannot get a perfect system. We have to get a practical system. Okay, So in this particular case, we would say that let's draw a line. I'm going to use a different color at phase, phase equal to... Okay, so I'm drawing this, and I'm going to say that, oh, I am this far away from 0 dB point, hmm? this part. And let's say in this case, it is 8 dB. I'm 8 dB below my unity gain point. Hmm? The actual number may be minus 8 dB, but we are talking about margins. Hmm? The margin is 8 dB. I have 8 dB margin. All right, is that part clear, what I have explained? Uh, the theoretical definition and all that stuff I've given you in the notes, but I think the insight needs to be visualizing how the how the plots are looking. Okay, is that clear? Any questions on this? Any doubts? If I want, Suraj, no question mark, right? Okay, all right. So uh, now, um, typically, uh, we want um, we want our phase margin to be let's say um, you know 60 to 70 degrees, because there is no point in overdoing all these things. Okay, because then it's not a good design. It's a, uh, and I'll, I'll show you why it's not a good design if you overdo something. Like having a phase margin of 90 degrees is uh, not necessarily a good thing. And I'll show you why. Okay. And then gain margin, we want the gain margin to be about 12 dB. Okay. Something like that. These are the good numbers. All right. And I'll, 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 I'll get into these later on one more time. Okay. And why are we doing all this stuff? Why are we dealing with loop gain all the time? Because are we really interested in the, in the loop gain? What are we overall interested in? Is the closed loop gain, because that's a system that we are designing, right? So the closed loop system is the one which needs to be stable. But closed loop system A divided by one over beta A is very difficult to wrap your head around, right? It's complicated, right? So what we say is, as engineers, we simplify the problem. We say, let me define some rules for beta times A of S, which is my loop gain. And it's very simple, you know, I can, I can understand it. So we, we deal with beta times beta times AS and we formulate some rules and the rules are gain margin, phase margin. And as soon as that happens, the closed loop system will be stable. Okay? All right? 
is that part clear why we are dealing with because that's i think that's the confusion that i see in many of the interviews that, that, that you know we are not really trying to do beta times as to be stable beta times as is always stable because they, if there is no feedback then uh, you know you don't really care uh, things will be stable no matter how many number of poles you have in the system it's only when you put things in feedback that's when we get in trouble hmm? okay so now um, let's kind of go through a few examples let's say I'm going to do pole locations for you. So this is my J omega axis and this is my uh, sigma axis. And let's say the two poles are here. So sigma P omega P minus omega P. And I'm talking about closed loop system, which is y of s divided by x of s. We are looking at the overall performance of our system. What do you think will happen here? Any? Let's go around. Uh, yeah, please. Huh? Okay. Uh, what do you mean by rise? Exponentially. Very good. Very good. Um, Harsh. Huh? Harsh. Good. Any other uh, comments? Anyone? Do you see that my poles are in the right of plane? If they are in the right of plane, our system is going to be unstable. Huh? That's for sure. Okay. So uh, if you if you look at this, um, you know, if you plot this in time domain, what you will see is, if you power it up, sorry, until it kind of you will it you will hit maybe the the rails or something like that, right? So this is exponential sigma p. T, hmm? this is in the time domain. So this is oscillations building up. Agree? Now, so this is time domain. So I'm giving you connection between the time domain versus frequency domain. Hmm? The next one we will do is um, this example. Then we have poles here on our plus omega p and minus omega p. What do you think will happen in this case? It's a perfect oscillator, and it will oscillate at omega p frequency. Okay, so uh, so then in the time domain, what I'm going to see is something like this. Okay, and frequency is going to be omega p. Okay, and the last one is going to be um, when I have uh, two poles which are like here, minus sigma p and omega p, something like this. And in this case, what do we expect? We will expect that whatever oscillation build up, they will eventually die down. I'll magnify this so that it's clear. something like this and this drop will be e to the power minus sigma p and this would be our stable system okay now you can also see that the closer you get to the imaginary axis okay the oscillatory behavior will be more pronounced just keep that in mind because we're going to use that somewhere all right okay so now we will um, we will start with a, with an example um, which is Let's say I have a one pole amplifier. Okay. So please, uh, you know, you know, write in your book, do the equations. It's kind of important. Let's say this one pole amplifier has a zero as my open loop gain, and it has only one pole, omega p one. Okay. And beta is constant. So what is my loop gain? Is equal to T of J omega or T of S is equal to um, beta A0 divided by 1 plus S divided by omega P1. Hmm. And let's do the, uh, right now we are going to go through brute force doing the evaluation so that we can connect the two dots, closed loop and open loop, what is going on or the loop gain. So closed loop.
will be y of s divided by x of s is equal to a0 divided by 1 plus s omega p1 divided by 1 plus a0 beta 1 plus s omega p1. Okay. So now I want you to solve this by yourself and regroup things and tell me what is the final outcome you are going to get. What will be the numerator and what will be the denominator? And we want it to look like some, some DC game and some poles in the denominator. We want to figure out what the poles are. And this is something that you have to kind of grind through yourself. If you have done, just raise your hand, so I'll, uh -huh. okay, all right. Uh, so yeah, uh, tell me what's the DC gain? One plus A naught beta, okay. And uh, denominator, can somebody tell me from here? Yeah, what is the denominator? Huh? One plus A, very good. So this will be um, 1 plus S divided by omega P1, 1 plus A0 beta. Did everybody get this? Yes? Hmm? Okay. So what is this telling me? Um, so this is telling me that my, um, let's draw, draw here, this was my condition, um, this is my loop gain log f and uh, what is this? This is 20 log of beta a of j omega hmm? and this was my omega p1 and something like this and this was minus 45 minus 90, zero. This is phase. Okay, and in this case, um, what I have taught you just now a few minutes ago, what is my gain margin and what is my phase margin? Can you tell me that? First of all, phase margin is easy, no? Can somebody raise hand? Um, yeah, please. Phase margin is? How did you figure that out? Huh, but basic definition of phase margin, you look for unity gain point. And where is the unity gain point? This is my unity gain point, correct? And then at the unity gain point, you went there and you looked at the phase, okay? And we say, yeah, it's close enough, minus 90 degrees is where the phase is. And we are away by 90 degrees from minus 180, uh, minus 180 point. Hmm? So this distance is 90 degrees. And that's why the phase margin is 90 degrees. Does everybody agree with me on this one? But this is kind of important. Um, once this is clear to you, we don't have to repeat this again and again as we get into circuits, okay? All right. And what is my gain margin? Gain margin? Infinity. Because, um, you know, it's asymptotically reaching minus 180 degrees and it's going to reach 180 degrees at infinity. And at that point, the gain has dropped so much. Right? So, this is what we uh, decide as uh, our gain margin is, okay? All right. So, will this system be stable? Huh? Unconditionally stable. This will be uh, stable, okay? And then if we plot the closed loop, okay? So, this is J omega axis and this is sigma. So, if beta was zero, where would be the pole location of our original system? Hmm? Minus omega p1. Does everybody agree? There is no feedback. Beta is zero. That means, right? So then the open loop equal to the closed loop straight away. And then our pole is at minus omega p1. And as beta keeps increasing, what do we expect? The pole will, pole location is going to, as beta increases, you will go away this way you will go in this direction. Everyone agrees, right? So this is kind of called a root locus, okay? Of closed loop hmm, response. 
So this is always stable. We, we do that generally to make sure the boundary conditions where things are going to get a little bit uh, dicey for us, right? Now, um, as kind of homework, what I would like you to do is, of course, the easiest stuff I do it in the classroom and harder stuff I give it to you to do in your homework, right? So what we can assume as an exercise is a two-pole system. A of S equal to 1 divided by 1 plus S divided by omega P1 and 1 plus S divided by omega P2. Okay? And go through the exact same analysis, what we have done, and visualize what's going on. So I, I will just do the fun part, which is visualization, right? The grunt work, the math, uh, I think you can, you can do it on your own. Uh, I mean, not, not really a big deal, right? So, so it's going to look like this. So this is my sigma, this is my um, j omega, and originally I had the two poles, minus omega p1 and minus omega p2, okay? And what you will see is, um, as your uh, beta is equal to zero, that's where you are. Okay? And then you will see something interesting. Um, as, as beta changes, you will see the poles will move. Now, I don't know how they will move, but we start saying something like this. So this is what I want you to kind of discover by, you, by yourself. And it's very interesting. Okay. Again, this will be stable because the final locations are still in the left side. You know, only when we get into the right side, we get in trouble. You know? We want to stay away from that again. Okay. Now, um, one more quick thing I want to uh, I want to tell you is uh, let's connect the dot between phase margin and um, and your transient response. What happens? Okay. So what happens when the phase margin is uh, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 70 degrees? And this is a very commonly asked question because what happens is we learn the definitions, but and we learn that oh the phase margin has to be greater than 60 degrees. Right? That's engraved in your head, but you are not able to articulate what exactly happens in time domain. So that's what I wanted to show you. All right. So let's say the phase margin is 45 degrees of a system. What does that mean? That means T of J omega unity, uh, T is a loop gain, is equal to 1 mod, but T of J omega unity angle is equal to, what is that? 45 degrees is phase margin. So what is the phase beta times A minus 135? Everybody is clear, right? Okay. All right. So these def definitions have to be clear degrees. Okay. So then let's do the closed loop gain. Closed loop gain. Um, y of S divided by X of S is equal to A of J omega U divided by 1 plus T of J omega U. We are only trying to figure out uh, this at omega U, unity gain frequency. What is the value? Okay, and we are trying to figure out, um, first of all, what should be the value? What is it that we desire? If A is large, what should be the closed loop response look like? 1 over beta. If A is very large, the DC gain, if the A is very large, then we should get at DC 1 over, we desire is 1 over beta. That's what we desire. Now let's see what happens in this case. Okay. So at unity gain frequency, um, okay, let's see uh, uh, what is the value. Okay, let's try to figure out what each one of them is. So we know that a of j omega u times beta is equal to. So mod of this is equal to. 1. Okay. So mod of A of j omega u is equal to 1 divided by beta. Are you getting that? We are only evaluating at omega u, unity gain frequency, because we are trying to figure out what is exactly going on there. Okay. And then, um, then uh, what is a T of j omega u? Again, mod of this is equal to? Mod of this is 1, right? Is it 1? Huh, loop gain is 1, correct. Okay. So, uh, and what is the angle of this? Is equal to 135 minus 135. 
okay so then uh, we can um, we can substitute this in complex terms so which will be uh, what we will get is a of j omega u and in the denominator uh, this uh, will become 1 plus 1 times exponential minus j 135 degree okay and then you can uh, solve for this and what you will get is a of j omega u divided by 0.29 minus 0.71 j okay so if you if you if you go through this expression cos of this plus j sin omega and then you can you can come up with this number right uh, that's all you have to do and then um, what is my uh, y of s mod of x of s is going to be equal to um, mod of this and mod of this that's what we will get so numerator is 1 divided by beta everybody gets that right and what is the denominator is going to be uh, 0.29 square plus 0.71 square and square root of that can somebody tell me what this is can you take a reciprocal of that one point three zero four we can ignore the zero four part for the hmm, one point three and divide by beta so what is this telling me what what was I expecting originally one over beta and what has happened it's actually gone up by thirty percent okay so this uh, realization is very important and this is happening only at unity gain frequency okay so originally if you look at the closed loop y of j omega divided by x of j omega we expected something like this something like this which is what you learn in your body plots right so this is our 1 over beta hmm, um, and uh, 20 log of whatever that is and what we actually see is at unity gain frequency which is right here instead of having 1 over beta what you will see is it will start picking up something like this sorry this is not right okay I drew it a little bit separate so that you can see the difference between the two and and this part now is 30 percent higher okay it's peaking now think about this as I my phase margin starts reducing what will you see what will happen this number exponential of j 135 this will start becoming j close to j 180 degrees we are going to go close to that and what you will see is that this number uh, 1.3 will start going up that's what you will see and then what you will see is you will see the thing go like this and you will kind of eventually see that you are oscillating at that particular frequency okay is that clear I'm just telling you um, as you move poles around this is what you will see in the simulator also you can see and that's why we want to stay away from that oscillatory behavior that's why we have set up those margins gain margin and phase margin okay Mm, no I don't yeah there is no relation I just drew an illustration for you basically you will see something picking up okay all right so um, and as this happens what you will see is um, y of t versus t now this is also one critical thing why not why shouldn't you design by itself to 90 degrees right because then you uh, a best way to eliminate the problem is kind of don't do that right if there is a famous joke any young man joke uh, you know he goes to the doctor and he says if I move my hand it hurts the doctor's obvious solution is don't move the hand right so then you can always say that don't have a second pole right you can just have one pole and you can get phase margin of 90 degrees right don't complain what is the problem with that solution in this case I cannot move my hand right in the other case if I don't have a second pole what is the problem that you need to realize no? Huh, correct Harsh is absolutely right does everybody get it why do we brought why why did we bring the second pole why is the second pole important to our design because we have two two uh, two poles each one is brought by gm r out 
um, you know, or are out uh, for that matter, right? And are out should be as high as possible. And only when you get, uh, you know, two poles, uh, two high frequency nodes, we are going to get more and more gain. You want GMR out times GMR out and you get GMR out square, right? So that magic will not happen if you don't have a second pole. So we cannot go away from that. Now, so let's say your phase margin is 45 degrees. Then your you will see something like this happening. If you give a step to your, uh, to your system, then you will see, you know, it will go doom, 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 and it will keep, eventually it will settle down, okay? And maybe okay, you know, if you don't care. Uh, many times we accept that as a close enough sometimes. But then for a high, high performance circuits, uh, this may not, be, may not be good, okay? And I'll show you where. So let's say you do phase margin of 90 degrees. What do you expect? If you do phase margin of 90 degrees, you're going to see something that looks like this. It's beautiful, perfect, right? But what is the problem that you see with this one? There is one keyword I'm trying to teach you from this, this picture is something called settling time. Huh? What is the settling time? You provide a jerk at the input and you see where the output settles. And whenever you say settle, what does that mean? Settle within a boundary. Always remember, we are not looking for the eventuality. We are looking for, hey, am I within 0.1% error? As an engineer, you always set the boundaries of acceptable limit. Huh? Everything is not going to be perfect. We, are, we don't want anything to be perfect. Because if you have something perfect, then it's useless. Okay? So we want to do something, kind of get close enough, and you optimize every possible thing to get the best. Huh? For that same amount of money, can I get the best performance out of this? Okay? So in this particular case, uh, let's say I, I, I define my uh, settling time to be, let's say 0.1%, okay? So that's a, the final value is still the same and, sorry, it's not looking, something like this, right? Um, no, okay, in this case. So here, let's say if I draw it, if that is my final value, then I'm going to settle here at this point. Let's say I, I put in 0.2%, 0.1%, whatever the error that I want in my final thing. So then uh, the settling time is too long, okay? So then what do we say? Let's reduce my phase margin and see what happens. So in this case, when, when the phase margin is uh, 45 degrees, we still have a problem because it's going to go bang, 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 and eventually it will settle down. And this may even have a worse settling time for that matter. I don't know. Okay. Now, uh, what you will find in literature and everywhere is that if you have a phase margin of um, 60 degrees, okay, or um, I mean there is a range uh, that I like to use is 60 to 72 degrees, hmm, somewhere there, then uh, you can Let's say you set the boundary. And that number is different for different uh, settling time. Okay, so this is my plus delta minus delta. And this is, let's say, my final value. And what you will see is you want a little bit of ripple, something like this. Okay, so this will happen when you are at 60 degrees or maybe uh, 72 degrees, something like that, somewhere in that range, okay. So you are entering that zone very quickly and then you don't leave that range, leave that room. If you leave, then again the settling time will keep increasing, okay. So there is a very good paper uh, by uh, Howard Yang and all star. I think we already talked about both of them in one of the regulated CAS code example, if you remember. So he, ha this is actually his PhD work. Um, and we were, uh, we worked together at Oregon State when I was doing my masters. So that's what he was working on. So um, what he did was um, in that paper is he kind of put everything as a variable. Uh, you have two pole locations as variable and he plotted the settling time. Because finally, we don't care about all this. What we care about is how quickly I settle. And then if you can figure out a magic number where I can keep my phase so that I settle very quickly, 
um, and those ripples are acceptable as soon as I enter that bank. So, uh, so he found that you know that the settling time kind of looks interesting, something like this. Okay. So this is my uh, phase margin versus settling time, and I think this number was I don't remember now. I think it was somewhere um, 72 degrees or something like that. Do you get what I'm saying? Hmm? So it's a nonlinear function because where you enter into that zone uh, is important, and this. Plot will change for each percentage, you know, how, uh, how, far, how, how much distance you have in terms of percentage. Error. Okay, so that, that's a very good paper to look at. Okay, um, anyway, that was a little bit of a, a digression to where I was going. Okay, so one obvious way was to reduce the gain, which is to reduce the beta, but that's not acceptable to us, right? Why wasn't that acceptable? Because we are making things worse, right? You're dropping the gain. And uh, as you drop the gain, what will happen? Your unity gain frequency will get lower and lower. So the, you cannot design a high performance, high frequency circuit, right? So we, we want to push limit as much as possible. So let's look at all other variables. Can, and today we are going to learn one of those methods, okay? So if you look at the two poles, okay, we have omega P1 and omega P2. So two, um, um, Obvious method, I said we drop the beta, but what else would you like to do? What else can you do just by looking at the locations of the pole to make it, uh, to improve our phase margin? What do you think we should do? Should we bring them closer? Yes, no? Remember the, the, the loop gain plot. What should we do? Utkarsh? Should you, uh, should you uh, try to bring omega p1 and omega 2 closer? What will happen if you do that? Phase will go faster down, right? And then you will, you will end up with? Correct. So it's actually worse. So what you really want is, you want, I mean, ideally, right? Omega p2 should be infinity, right? I want omega p2 at infinity, right? To get a stable system. So then, of course, infinity is not acceptable. So we want it to be a little bit away from from the unity gain frequency of our system, right? So let's say I have, this was my original plot. This is omega p1, omega p2, okay? So one thing I want is, I want to move this guy outside. So then what will happen is, the new plot will look like this, correct? This is definitely better. Everybody agrees, right? Because I moved omega p2 out. So this would be my new omega p2. But this may not be possible because that means you are, um, you know, in your circuit, you want something to have some kind of negative capacitance or something somewhere, okay? So what's the other obvious thing we can do? Pull omega p1 inside. So we can also do this, uh, which is the solution suggested by um, him. So let's see, what I can do is this. And then as, as you can see that, you know, as, you, as I get closer and closer, my, uh, my loop gain is dropping. The phase location is still the same. And uh, as soon as I start doing that, my phase margin will improve. Okay, so these are the two possibilities. And if you're a greedy engineer, then what would you like to do? You want to do both. Huh? You want to just move them around by doing some trick. So that, that those are the tricks we are going to learn today. And a little bit of math is involved. And this part is called frequency compensation. Okay, so we, what we are going to learn today is Okay. And if you are even greedier, right, what else would you do? So let me just, uh, I, I just want you to stretch your imagination, right? So let's say I have, originally I had this and this, omega p1, omega p2, hmm? and then I could do this, uh, I'm just drawing another axis here, down here, to say that, okay, I would like to do this and this, so this goes here, this goes here, okay? And 
can you stretch your imagination what else can we do hmm? huh? who's our friend in this case you to to take care of a pole huh? how do, how can i neutralize a pole zero but zero where do you remember that discussion we had a good zero and a bad zero huh? Huh? Huh. Many. so which kind of zero do we want a right half plane zero or a left half plane zero right half plane zero if it's a right half plane zero will you be able to neutralize because what does right half plane now you will appreciate why i call it a bad guy huh? or a girl bad girl whatever huh? so um, imagine this right the zero is in the right half plane and what are the things we are trying to do when we are talking about gain margin and phase margin we want to pull the gain down as early as possible okay and we want to keep phase as good as possible okay so pole drops down by 90 degrees and what does the right half plane do a uh, right half plane zero do it drops the frequency its phase response is same as a pole in the left half plane right do you see that but the gain response it keeps it flat so right half plane uh, zero is actually the worst thing that can happen to you is that part clear because once you appreciate that then you will understand why i call it a bad guy huh? so if you have a right half plane zero then no good it will actually make things worse than almost like a pole right at least the pole drops the gain down but uh, the zero will hold the gain but the phase will uh, phase will keep dropping so if right half plane is not a good guy then what do you do the pole is in the left half plane so if we want to put a zero we want to put it on top okay. so left half plane zero will give you that benefit it will compensate the pole's behavior so uh, i mean you could you could potentially kind of bring in a zero somewhere there wherever to kind of make that happen for you okay so those are that's the stretch of imagination i want you to have all right so now let's go to uh, now we are going to go through a little bit of a grunt work uh please draw schematics please write the all the small signal and everything right so we are going to go back to our, our ota and you will have fun you know once you because all the stuff that i have done so far i'm just building up to this so if you have followed whatever we have done so far then now you will be able to follow quickly able to follow what we are trying to do so two stage ota and um, make sure you get the signs right i1 i2 and i implement using m5 and m7 here this is m1 m2 m3 m4 m6 and this is my v out c n and i'm going to label these nodes a and b so which is a positive input which is a negative input m1 or m2 can you tell yeah um, which one yeah vivan huh m2 is positive does everybody agree huh because you have one inversion and then the second inversion to the output and this is my negative input okay and i'm just saying that the i1 is implemented using m5 and i2 is implemented using uh, m7 like what we did before so we will label the capacitance at that point right so um as i said um what is the impedance at ga or um conductance at node a can somebody tell assume differential signal so then you can assume uh, the tail to be virtual ground hmm? Hmm. what is ga 
जी डी एस वन प्लस जी एम थ्री प्लस जी डी एस थ्री ओके एंड देन वॉट डू वी से दिस इज इक्वल ऑन टू जी एम थ्री ओके देन वॉट इज अबाउट जी बी जी डी एस टू प्लस जी डी एस फोर ओके एंड जी सी इज इक्वल टू जी डी एस सिक्स प्लस जी डी एस सेवन एंड एवरीबडी अंडरस्टैंड दिस रिप्रेजेंटेशन राइट आई एम जस्ट इंप्लीमेंटिंग दैट यूजिंग अ सिंगल ट्रांसिस्टर राइट नाउ आई एम जस्ट नॉट ड्रॉइंग इट सो सो दैट इज इजी टू अंडरस्टैंड ओके सो नाउ इन दिस केस वॉट डू यू सी रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन दीज थ्री दीज आर अवर टू हाई इंपीडेंस नोट्स एंड जी ए विल बी लो इंपीडेंस okay what else we have here how about this there is a small capacitance here of gds um, sorry what is the capacitance here c gd and what does that give you you remember okay so let me do it here so think about this again since it's pmos it may be uh, difficult for you hmm? c g d i am explicitly showing and what is going on from um, node c uh, sorry not node c did i label okay sorry i should have labeled this also even though it's a v out i'm calling it node c for convenience right now so this is my node c and this is not node b so between node b and node c hmm, what is happening there you have inversion or no inversion inversion do you see that shruti inversion right and uh, uh, then that inversion looks like a gm if you remember that correct gm times v b correct it's going to go up and when the zero happens hmm, and it's a zero Uh, there is a inversion whenever there is a inversion where is the zero location left up or right up right up plane huh? that's what we learned earlier and this is all uh, like um, tricks that i have taught you i mean you can grind through all the equations but this is a quick way to tell if there is a inversion the zero is in the right up plane and it's a good zero or bad zero bad zero good not good but bad zero okay so and the way we figure that out as the current flies like this right the current through cgd will will go through uh, gm vb um uh to to ground and then the location of the zero rhp zero is given by gm6 divided by cgd6 okay so if you if this is uh um if this is new to you then you have to look back few few pages in our notes and we have done this a few times right um okay so this is my zero and what do you think about the location of this zero where would it be compared to uh this ga and uh, you know all these what's in the numerator gm so it should be at a gm value should be high compared to gds and then how about cgd cgd is a small number right because it's a it's that overlap capacitance okay so at node b and node c we have substantial capacitances like cgs and things like that and specifically node c we have external load capacitance cl okay so they can dominate whereas in this case this is mainly a parasitic effect okay so then now um, you know just by looking at this we can drop our uh, image here something like this so uh, i will have first of all i will know i know that this ga is at a very high frequency correct so then we can say that okay the pole due to a is somewhere at high frequency and similarly the zero due to this is at high frequency i call it zero due to uh, b here hmm? and then uh, these gb and gc related poles uh most likely the the first pole will be uh, pc and then the second pole will be pb okay why did i do that 
because at GC I have a large capacitance. Hopefully that CL, whatever load capacitance I'm driving, is a large enough uh, capacitance. So that's why the pole C is kind of uh, closer. Uh, are you with me on this so far? Whatever I have done on the um, as a location. So just by inspection, we were able to look at the poles and zeros of the circuit. Huh? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I did that intentionally. Thank you so much. So this should be pole. He's absolutely right. Okay, everybody's with me so far. Good catch. Okay. Now uh, let's just write down here. Um, what is my omega a? Hmm? Can you tell me? Omega a is gm3 divided by. Um, look at this. Who's going to dominate here? CGS3 and CGS4, okay, they are the large capacitance, the gate capacitance. So we can say that, okay, all right. GM3 divided by CGS3, and I'll just say, okay, two times CGS3, because they are the same, they match, right? And how about omega B equal to, in the numerator I had GDS2 plus uh, GDS4, okay. And then uh, who was the dominating capacitance at node B? It's the CGS6. The gate to source capacitance will dominate. Okay. So this would be CGS6. And then uh, the pole location, uh, the third uh, omega C will be equal to uh, GDS6 plus GDS7 divided by load capacitance, CA, okay. And zero location, what did we say? GM6 divided by CGD6, okay. So what we just went through right now, okay, is a very important step. Just by looking at the schematics, what did we do? We quickly figured out where is the pole, what is the relative relationship of all the poles, where is the zero coming from. Well, this is a very important step. So any complex circuit, Within like five minutes, we are able to draw this picture, okay? So I think all of you are very powerful now, if you can do this, okay? So it's a very important step to understand from simple, simple things, how do you build this thing? And then now we can tell, how do I fix this schematic, okay? Are you with me so far? Is there any doubt in what we did so far? If there is a doubt, I will repeat this again and again, because you have to get to this stage. Anyone? Any confusion so far, what I have done? Shruti, you are good? Okay. All right. Haan, bolo, tell me. Which part? How did I use the capacitance values? Okay, all right, very good, okay. So, um, we know, okay, when, when I did the transistor analysis, when I showed you the, what do you call that? The candy bar, everything, all those kind of things, right? The most dominant capacitance in a MOSFET is CGS. Uh, that's one thing we learned. Everything else is kind of, yeah, we don't want it to be there, but it's there, we have to take that into account. But right now we are doing just a paper design, okay? So we want to latch on to the dominant things, okay? So in, in case of node A, what do you see quickly? You see two CGSs, which are going to dominate. Of course, you can add CGD, you can add, uh, you know, every little detail in the equation, but then it'll, it'll make matter confusing, okay? So I made those approximations just by inspection, said that in this case there is two CGS, CGS of three and CGS of four, okay, all right. And I ignored the, uh, the drain to bulk capacitances, all those kind of things, because I know that there are two dominant pictures that I have to deal with. Similarly, when I go to node B, what do you see? There will be uh, a drain to bulk of M2 uh, and drain to bulk of M4, but I said, okay, you know, the, who's the most dominating guy here? is a CGD of a C gate to source of 6, okay? So that's why I picked those numbers. Other things will be within 10%, somewhere here and there. Uh, so in actual simulation, they'll show up, okay? But then for paper design, we can deal with this. Are you with me so far? Okay, all right. So if you're with me so far, then now let's grind through the uh, one more thing. Um, so what do we want again in this case? Our goal is to do something so that this thing goes here and this thing goes here. Something like that. I mean, not necessarily PC and PB 
in that direction it could be completely flipped we don't care as long as the distance or the ratio of um, pb over pc as long as, long as i can improve the ratio of pb over pc okay because then they'll go further apart and if that happens then what's the advantage we're going to get what is going to improve phase margin is going to improve so then things will get stable all right that's that's our goal right now so um, one quick um, trick that i want to teach you before we jump into the actual analysis is the following okay so the trick is called miller compensation and i think you have probably heard about this right somewhere so in us when i use this miller compensation people laugh you know why because there is a beer called miller so there are lots of tv ads coming in the miller time miller time so i used to use the word miller time but here you will not laugh because you will not know the background behind it but miller compensation okay so miller compensation is you have a gain of minus let's say some a2 negative gain and i'm just going to show you the final effect first okay and let's call this c c and let's call this v1 and if there is a gain of minus a2 then what's the output minus a2 times v1 now let's see what is my z in is equal to v1 divided by i i1 okay now since the current through this amplifier a2 is zero because there will be some kind of gate the current will only flow here and for a what is the current flowing through capacitor voltage times some s c times the voltage that would be the so in this case what's the voltage across the capacitor v1 minus minus a2 v1 that's the voltage and times s c c okay that will be the current so now let's see what happens here so we get v1 divided by v1 1 plus a2 s times c c so v1 goes away and what is my impedance now s c c times 1 plus a2 okay and what do you see what have we done this a2 is generally a large number right because you have a gain from point a to point b of some gmr out so we have kind of multiplied the value of the capacitor by that gain isn't that cool that's what we've been doing right we had gmr out and gmr out we multiplied two gmr outs here we have a capacitance of cc value and then we multiplied the effectiveness of that capacitance by factor of gmr out it could be 20 30 40 whatever right and this is what is called miller uh, basically miller effect okay and this is true with any impedance right as long as you have gain and you'll get something like this all right so we will be using this effect um, in our circuit right now so let's do a um for this particular circuit you have it in your book right so i won't be able to show it to you here but what i'm going to do now is i'm going to draw a small signal model for this particular circuit okay and that's what we're going to cover today till the end so i have and if i make a mistake right somebody caught me here now you have to catch me if i make a mistake sometimes i make a mistake here so please watch okay so this is our original v in plus v in and then the current what was that current gm1 v in and that's going to go through gb cb node cb so this is my node b and then i have another node which is um, this is again uh can you just double check the numbers uh, the 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 indexes uh because i don't have the schematic in front of me gm6 times vb okay that's the current source and then i have is gm6 correct huh the direction 
Okay, good. I'm glad you said that because then uh, that means should the direction of the current be up or down? Where is it going? Even even if it is shown this way, it's going to ground. Okay. So in this case, you got it, no? Uh, because we are we are doing AC analysis. Okay. Does everybody get it? Huh? I mean, what is your name? Dinesh pointed out, hey, you know, you you made a, a wrong direction in the current. Okay. Um, he's he's right about that uh, because the current is going to go that way, right? If um, uh, from from V out to up. But the when you do the AC analysis, we ground the top node. Okay? So then we can flip it around. And that's the confusion you have to get over with for a PMOS. Okay, so that's why it is going down like this. And then you should have your GC. And what's the last thing we had? Dominating cap? CL. Okay. So this is my node C, which is also V out. Okay. And what was the new thing we added? We added a cap. CC. Okay. Because we have this gain from this point to this point, B to C, large gain of GMR out. And it's an inverting gain. So I want to add a compensation capacitance over there. And um, I'm just giving you a heads up that, oh, you know, when that happens, the capacitance effectiveness gets multiplied. Okay. You will have uh, GMR out times the capacitance, which is going to node A, uh, node B. What do you expect then to happen? At node B, by adding a Miller uh, capacitance CC, what did we do? We made that dominating, right? Because uh, Miller effect will will give you a lot more capacitance at this node now. Uh, CC times uh, uh, the A of the next stage, one plus A, right? And then we are hoping that the node B will dominate now. So if the node B dominates because of this gain, what do you expect to happen? It will go very close to our, uh, x, on the x-axis, it will go very close to origin. And let's see what happens to node C, okay? because that's what we want to see. right? So right now, um, no tricks, nothing, brute force, KCL, KVL analysis. Okay, So go ahead and do that. And while, while you do that, I'll also do it. So the circuit is, have you followed this circuit, how I do this circuit? This part you have to get. Um, is there any error in what I have done so far? Because now we will start doing the KCL, KVL type of business. Yeah, yeah, it's a large value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CGD is a parasitic effect. Okay. All right. So. Let's grind through the equations. I will also do it here, but you also should attempt on your own. Okay. So the first equation is going to be GM. Uh, GM1 V in plus uh, GB plus SCB hmm, times VB. So I'm just doing a KCL at node B. SCC VB minus V out is equal to 0. So that's my first equation. The second equation is going to be at node C at this point, which is SCC VB minus V0. That's a current coming in in this node, which is equal to GM6 VB plus GC plus SCL and times V0. So this is number 2. Okay. Does everybody get that? Two KCLs at two nodes I have done. And here in this particular equation, I can eliminate. It's only in terms of VB and V0. So VB, we are not interested. We are looking at VO versus VN, right? So VB, we have to eliminate. So can you tell me what VB expression is based on the Equation 2, somebody? Do you have it? Anyone who has it, just raise your hand. You have to look at equation number 2 
and tell me um, uh, tell me uh, VB in terms of VO. Anyone has it? Ha, huh, please tell me. CC, right? In the numerator. And the denominator? Okay. Now, now what do we do? We substitute this back here and here. And then we will get V in and V out equation, as simple as that. So, what I'll do is I will uh, probably, what should I do? Should I go through the whole thing? Yeah, let's just go through everything because it's, uh, there are some subtleties that I want to point out, right? So, it's going to be, please bear with me, it's a little bit GM1, um, V in plus, we will have GB plus S, CB plus CC. GC plus S, CCL plus CC, divide by minus SCC times V0 is equal to 0. Okay. So, um, then uh, what are we looking for? Then we are looking at the numerator. Yeah, okay. So it's going to be, I'm just, I'm just going to push this over here and see what happens, right? So it's going to be SCC minus GM6 times GM1 times V in. Um, please make sure I don't make a mistake, huh? Ganesh, in terms of calculations. And then the numerator will be, um, GB plus S, uh, CB plus CC, and then GC plus S, CL plus CC minus SCC hmm, minus GM6, and the whole thing is multiplied by V0 equal to 0. I may have made some mistake on the, on the, huh, this additional bracket, okay. So now let's just simplify this piece um, first and what you will see is uh, I have three terms, one is GB times GC plus SCB plus CC times GC plus S CL plus CC times GB GM6 square CB CL plus CC CL CB CC. Okay. Now is a key important insight. Uh, the important insight here is um, what are these terms, GB and uh, GC? Are they low or high? Low, right? Because we want high output impedance compared to GM6. Okay. So what you can, uh, what you can say is that uh, since GC, GB is much much less than GM6, I can ignore these. These two. Uh, we are doing hand waving approximations to get to a point. Okay. okay. And then, uh, so then we can write down uh, our expression as SCC minus 6 GM1 V input plus this one GB GC. We are almost there, okay? 6 plus S square CB 
CL plus CC CL hmm, times V0 is equal to 0. Okay. So now we can uh, write the final expression V0 divided by Vn will be equal to, we will get Gm1 divided by Gb. Second term will be Gm6 divided by Gc. So what is this? DC gain. Okay, we, our goal is to figure out end to end transfer function hmm? and we get DC gain and in the numerator what will you get? We already know the answer to that. C, C divided by Gm6. And what was that in the numerator? It is called right of plane 0 which is what we did it based on our insights and you will see it right here. And the denominator is the fun part. Okay? Now you will think I am crazy when I say fun part but let us see. So you have CC divided by GB times GC plus S square CBCL plus uh, CLCC plus CBCC divided by GBGC. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, looking at this, I mean, we just did so much math, right? I mean, you know, doing it in the classroom is very painful for me because it's not fun. Um, the reason I did all this stuff is to make you appreciate, you know, how do you get a nugget of information from this whole complex analysis, right? What was the first thing we got? This is something that we do by inspection. Uh, as soon as I show you the circuit, you know, GM divided by this node and GM divided by this node, um, I get my gain, which is what we got here. Other thing was by inspection was the zero location, right? We know how to get the zero location. Now the denominator part is very interesting here. And what does that look like? That's a combo of two poles, right? I have, um, you know, two poles. When you multiply those two terms together, you'll have an S square term, right? So now, uh, what we are going to do um, before you leave, I have 10 minutes, so perfect. You know, that's a good time to finish this. Um, there is something I'm going to teach you called dominant pole hmm, approximation. Okay. So the assumption is, let's say I have two poles in a system. One is called PD and PND. So one is a dominant and one is non-dominant. So what can you tell when I say that about their location? Shruti, what do you think will, uh, what does that mean? I say PD is dominant compared to PND. What does dominant mean? You are close to origin, you are a lot closer to origin because its impact will be a lot higher, right? And ND is non-dominant. So what do you think will be the magnitude of PD and PND, relationship between them? PD and PND. PD should be lot smaller, right? Agreed? Yeah? PD will be a lot closer to origin, right? So then um, in that case, if I have an expression that looks like S divided by PD and 1 plus S divided by PND, okay? This is what we are trying to get to. What will be the expression? 1 plus 1 over PD plus 1 over PND and now you will see where I am going with this plus square divided by PD, PND. Okay? Agreed? And then what is the next approximation we are going to do? We said dominant pole. So who is going to dominate out of this? Huh? 1 by PD. Okay? So everybody agrees, right? Then if it is a dominant pole approximation, I am going to ignore this piece. So then for dominant pole approximation, it is going to look like 1 over S divided by PD plus S square divided by PD, P and D. All right. So now let us look at our original expression right here, right here. Okay. And now compare the two. What can you tell? Immediately, what is PD equal to? 
P D equal to what did we say? It is uh, huh, G B G C divided by C C G M six. Huh? So looking at this is not interesting. Okay, let's make it interesting. Okay, what was the original case? Was G B divided by C C. Let's say that was the, and then divide that by G M six divided by G C. Now it looks interesting, right? Do you see something interesting happening? I am dividing by the gain, which is G M six G C. That was the gain of the last stage. Okay, I'll, I'll go over this one more time. And what happens to our P and D? Non-dominant pole, P and D is equal to G B. Look at your notebook. Hmm? C B C L plus uh, C C C L plus C B C C. Okay, and then uh, on top of that, there is a a PD expression, so that will be uh, CC GM6 GC. So I'm just uh, going at at this part, and that part is given here. I'm just relating this to this. Okay, that's all I'm doing. And now here something interesting will fall. Which is, what do you think about these? What's the approximation we can make? The CB and uh, CB is like a natural capacitance at that node, right? And who are the intentional dominant capacitances in this? CC and CL. So you can say that, oh, this is going to dominate. It's obvious, right? All right. So then we can make that approximation and we say that, oh, this is going to be GB, GC divided by CC, CL times CC, GM6, GB and GC. Okay, so then uh, what can we cancel? We can cancel this cancels, this cancels and then uh, uh, okay and CC will cancel and this will look like a GM6 over CL. Okay. And I can also say that this is actually GM6 divided by GC hmm, times GC divided by CL, just for the sake of it, okay. So originally this was my case, GC divided by CL and what did I do here? I multiplied that by gain. So one pole I divided by gain, other pole I multiplied by gain. So you get a double effect, right? So you are stretching things out. So, original case was, uh, I think, uh, what, let's go to the original, huh, right here. So, this was the original thing and then um, what we would get is the new location, I'll put it in, in this color, yeah, then we'll stop right there, okay. So, the new location will be here and here, the red one, after compensation. And what was the, the nearer location? We had GB divided by CC divided by GM6 divided by GC, okay? So it gets divided by gain and then the, the farther location will get multiplied. So this is GM6 divided by GC times GC divided by CL. Okay, so we kind of stretch them apart. I mean, we didn't really stretch them apart. The B went close by and C went far away. Something like that happened. And of course, by doing this now, we suddenly have improved our phase margin. Okay, so that was the first discovery. But what is the problem with this circuit? Using our tricks that I taught you, few classes. Who's the bad guy? Zero, what will happen to the zero? Zero ke denominator mein kya aega? Earlier it was CGD. Now what is in the denominator? CGD plus CC. Okay. So the CGD plus CC, CC is also we are intentionally capacitor. So what will happen to zero B? It will go in this location. Okay. So it will come closer. Hmm? So this will become 
gm6 divided by cc okay so we solve one problem huh? and this is an acceptable solution many people use this solution okay but i mean i wanted to you to have this step by step discovery you know fix problems so next week we will solve this problem you know we'll we'll take care of this bad zero okay the, let's let's recap what we did today we um, uh, we reviewed uh, a frequency response of a one pole system then we did two pole system and we figured out as the phase margin gets worse we understood phase margin and gain margin little bit in detail and as phase margin gets worse what happens the peaking starts happening and it's showing oscillatory behavior so then what we said is we have to do something called frequency compensation and frequency compensation what are we trying to do the two poles p1 and p2 we want to spread them apart keep them away from each other so that we get the gain drops quickly and phase is still holding okay so we get good phase margin and good gain margin and in that process what did we do we use something called miller effect and miller effect what does it do it amplifies capacitance value if i have put cc then it will get amplified by the gain it's not an amplification of a voltage but value of the capacitance is increased cc times 1 plus a and if i add extra capacitance without using the capacitance physical value of the capacitance that's great right then i have to save the area and so we did this and then what was the problem with this method everything is good people still use this but what the problem was the bad guy came closer huh? so next week we will uh, start with dealing with the bad zero thank you very much thank you